me today at the wheel of an Italian masterpiece powered by another Italian masterpiece. Yes, I'm driving an Alfa Romeo 166 3 litre. There is an unwritten rule that whenever the Italians build a big executive car, that it'll be more comfy than anything else in the market, it will handle better than anything else in the market, and it will look better than anything else in the market. And no one will buy it. And that's true, unfortunately, for this, the 166, the last big Alfa Romeo executive luxury car. And this one is a very, very late pre-facelift 3-litre V6, which is the one to have. So just look at this thing, look at the curves, look at the shape, the swoop, the tiny headlights, that's kind of strange, isn't it? But would you rather have this? Or would you rather have something bland and boring like an E-Class or a 5 Series? I mean, seriously, you can argue that this was the most unreliable car in 2002 and the most warranty claims in 2002, but I've owned a BMW from the early noughties, and I can tell you they went wrong far more than Alphas did in the real world, so who's wrong now? This is a big car, it's nearly three metres long. Um, there were three engine choices, of which we got two. There was a 2.4 litre five cylinder diesel, which is a fantastic engine, didn't come to the UK sadly. There was a two litre petrol, the Twin Spark, which we're familiar with from the 147, 145, 146, 156 and many others, which seems a little bit small for this. What you really wanted was the V6, which makes this car come alive. Just look at it, look at the big Brembo calipers, the big alloys, the V6 underneath it. This is a GT car in an executive body. So, amazing styling and beautiful comfy seats aside, and of course the great handling, this is the star of the show. This is why you don't want an S-Class or an E-Class diesel. This is the Busso V6 engine, one of the legendary all-time great motors of, of all time. In this case, it's a three litre. There was also a 2.5 litre available, and very briefly at the end, a 3.2, but this is the sweet spot in the middle. In the pre-facelift cars, this made 226 horsepower and 275 newton meters of torque. After the facelift in 2003, you'll notice this is a late 2002 car, so it just misses that. They added an extra cap and it dropped to 220 and 265 horsepower and newton meters. But just look at it, look at the chrome inlets, look at oh, just everything. It's a piece of automotive artwork, the noise it makes, the power it delivers. This is why we don't want electric cars for everything. Some cars are great if you electrify them, it improves them. Other cars, it steals the soul. This car has a soul. One thing it also has is the most ridiculous washers you've ever seen. Under here is the windscreen washer filler. This is an abnormally small washer filler at the best of times. That's about a centimetre across inside. What looks like quite a big opening, there's a one centimetre aperture. This takes 12 litres of fluid. Can you imagine how long that would take? So very, very alpha. Also so very, very alpha, it's this fuse box here, well not fuse box, this junction box here, which is the main wiring loom junction box on the back of the uh, inlet manifold, so it gets very, very hot and melts. And back here we have the uh, heater matrix, which is a fairly common place, except the ECU is underneath the heater matrix, and the heater matrix leaks onto the ECU. There are many ways to kill a 166. So this is perhaps the most contentious part of the entire 166. These little headlights, they look so tiny compared to the, the mass of the rest of the car. Um, when 2003 came around and they facelifted the car, they changed this. They gave it much more conventional, ordinary looking lights, which you would think people would have lapped up and gone, great, well done, Alpha, you've given us normal looking lights. But in fact, everyone went, oh, you've ruined the 166. Where are the interesting lights gone? Seriously, they cannot win. <laughs> also, you may notice this quite unusual, um, almost aftermarket looking front grille on the car. This is standard as well. There is a, a more normal looking silvery plastic one which lower spec cars got, but in this spec, incidentally this rattles because the clips come off the back of the grille and you can't get to it to replace it and basically they're unobtainable. Um, this is standard. This is what came with the car from Alfa Romeo. Now the pre-facelift cars look better at the back as well. The lights on these look like some kind of evil demonish bug eye when you're following the car, which is which is very cool, very mafioso, isn't it? Um, and if you are going to be doing mafioso type things and need to get in the boot, it's not the most convenient thing really. There's a button in the glove box, or you need to use the behind the uh, behind the badge trick, which Alpha used for a long time, and use your key to get in the back there. Uh, so it's actually not a huge boot considering how big the car is because uh, the uh, centre section is you know, saloon size but the side panels here are filled with all kinds of audio, visual and sat-nav entertainment as well as the six disc changer. We also have the DVD or CD for the sat-nav which is the reason the car came out in 1998 not 1996. I'll tell you about that in a second. 
this goes back a fairly long way and there is just a ski hatch in the center there's no folding seats so really this is about the small I'm, i think actually this is smaller than the boot on a 156 which is an entire category smaller underneath the carpet we have full size 16 inch alloy spare wheel which would uh, look nice on the car if it didn't have these rather nice in fact much nicer upgrade wheels on it we also have the car battery here on the left hand side adding to perfect ish 70 30 weight distribution <laughs> Now, people criticize the quality of Alfa Romeos, but they really are missing the point because you get in pulling a beautiful piece of cast aluminium, the door shuts with a nice thump, and then you are sitting in these incredible leather seats which would not be out of place in a GTV or a Spider. Certainly, they're very similar to the ones in the 156, which are some of the most comfortable car seats you will ever sit in, and the leather Alfa Romeo use is I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's the best leather I've ever come across in a car. You find cars like this, which have got over 170,000 miles. I sold my 156 with leather seats in it at 155,000, and the leather barely looks worn. The seats haven't collapsed. I, considering how many other problems people report with Alphas, the interiors are not one of them. So this is an interior that looks like it would be at home in a, in a GT car, a sports car, rather than an executive saloon. So let's look around and see what we've got in here. Right, so we're inside the cabin of the 166. Now the first thing to notice is the swathes of leather. This car has the uh, Alfa Romeo logo embossed Momo leather sports seats, which are, as I just said, some of the best seats you'll ever find in any car. It's understandable why so many Alphas have given their lives to have these things turned into office chairs. There'd be a lot more 156s on the road if their seats weren't so nice. The door cards, I've all got these typical Alfa Romeo diagonal stitching which is a very common theme in a lot of Alfa Romeos. Then we have the tweeter and the chrome door handle side by side. This was I think similar to the design in the facelift 147s as well. And we have a bit of a door pocket and a good size loudspeaker with a nice little chrome ring. And these doors are, they do feel very big and very heavy but they have a lovely smooth action as they drift shut and clunk with a real quality feel to them. Now moving into the dashboard, we've got the same strange cutaway as the 145 and I think the later 147. 156 didn't have it quite as much as this. Very, very sculpted away. And the glove box also sculpts into the bottom as well in a line across the front of it. We have these little eyeball vents, one in the far corner and three here in the center. This is a, again, a very Italian, very Alfa Romeo thing. You find these kind of things in all sorts of Lancias, Alphas, everything, Maseratis, you name it. They all had the little eyeball vents. Up here in the center of the top of the dashboard, we've got a little cubby hole, which has decided it won't open today. I believe this is our actual tea shelf because there is no other tea shelfery going around. We'll return to this in a second with a cup. Now, move over to the dials. Let's check these things out. Check out how the speedometer just cuts into and bisects into the rev counter and then both the main dials do the same thing to the sub dials. It's a beautiful bit of design. The little chrome rings set everything apart. Now unlike the 156 which had those amazing big cowled individual dials, this is all one complete unit but it does look absolutely fabulous and we've got a separate bank underneath the dials showing all our warning lights. Now you will notice possibly, that the uh, engine warning light, bottom left underneath the battery, is very faint compared to the rest of the warning lights. This is because it has been on an awful lot, because there is apparently a fault code which says the engine warning light has been on, so the engine warning light being on triggers the engine warning light, so the engine warning light stays on forever, and the fault is that the engine warning light is on. That's so very alpha. Uh, down to the right of the steering wheel, we've got another reliable vent and we've got headlight levelling, although these are self-steering and self-levelling uh, headlights anyway because they are bi-xenons and the headlight switch, this is a little turny dial thing. Just two stalks behind the steering wheel. The left-hand one indicators and cruise control and lights. The right-hand one is the wipers. Now we need to look at that main driver's wiper because that is quite a thing. Get ready for this. This is the uh, windscreen washer. That's a pantograph wiper. Then we have the steering wheel. It's a very, very pretty Italian steering wheel. Just a nice little bit of sculpting, hard, smooth leather, and a center section which just has the Alpha logo, obviously that's an iconic thing in itself, and the horn. Do the horn test. Yes, that's a proper Italian get out of my way horn. The Italians are fond of their horns, so you will find a good horn in an Italian car. Hooting is something they do a lot of. 
Now into the centre section. Now this is worthy of note. Here in the centre we've got slightly randomly placed um, fog lights and the hazard warning lights next to the CD player, FM AM radio and the big screen colour uh, Alfa Romeo units, which I think is not an Alfa Romeo, it's just rebranded by them, Satnav system, which is described in an Alfa Romeo book as the avant-garde of technology and described by everyone else as rubbish. The CD player and cassette player and radio and telephone and navigation system was introduced with the car in 1998. However, the car was actually initially revealed to the press in 1996, at which point everyone went, hang on, we've not got a sat-nav in that car and BMW and Mercedes and Audi have all got sat-navs, so we should probably have one. It turned out developing a sat-nav and finding a way of redesigning the entire dashboard took about two years. So the car was released in 1998, not 1996. Now, below that, we've got heating and ventilation, air conditioning controls, which don't look quite as glamorous as you'd expect in a car like this. Alphas tend to have slightly more exciting dials with bits of chrome and colour and stuff, and they, they really haven't this time. Just pretty basic black buttons. Uh, central locking button, ASR off, so a stability control can be turned off if you want. And the button for the fuel cap, front and centre. I guess being a V6, you'd be using that fairly frequently. And 12 volt socket. Uh, usefully right there in the middle. This car isn't automatic. There are two different gearbox options for the car. There was a five-speed manual available on everything, but this uh, automatic was only available on the V6. Now, moving back with a little push-to-release ashtray, which releases very slowly indeed. Uh, and a proper... I won't, won't reseal now. And a proper handbrake. There is also a pull-down armrest in the centre. Up above, unlike the Alpha 90, which we, uh, I think was the last Alpha Romeo we drove, there is just an ordinary ceiling. How very normal. Big lights and alarm stuff. Then we have a big executive level back seat. So we have this centre cubby hole, which is really our only tea shelf and really only any good for a small espresso and nothing else. You might be able to get a bottle of Orangina in there, but actually I don't think you can. I think the bottles are too wide. So in terms of tea shelfery, the executive express We'll have to whisk you hurriedly to a motorway service area because you will not be carrying anything of your own. There's a tiny recess in the front of this flocked area, which is good for, I don't know what, maybe a USB stick, but this car was built 10 years before USB sticks were a thing. It's too short for a pen. It's too completely the wrong shape for a business card. It's too narrow for a AA battery. I have no clue what that could be for. And the back seat area is pretty good for knee room. It's maybe not quite as good as a, an E-Class or a 5 Series, but certainly you're not doing too badly. But feet are a little bit tight under the seat. And there's a slightly weird thing getting in and out because uh, the swooping roofline does slightly encroach in your head area. And these sporty bucket seats you've got in the back are really, really uh, tight, basically. Um, you, they are clenching the buttocks for you. You don't have to do any bum clenching yourself if the driver's getting a bit spirited because the car's pre-clenched you. Um, which, if you are maybe a slightly more commodiously, uh, generously proportioned uh, executive sitting in the back, this might not be the most comfortable car in the world. For just kids of executives, this would be absolutely perfect. Uh, the leather is just the same fantastic stuff you get in the front. You've got eyeball vents, same as in the front. You've got 12 volt socket, which is not a common thing in, well, a car of this, this vintage. And nice big pockets in the door as well. It's an Italian car, so obviously there are little tiny uh, ashtrays in the door, ideal for uh, a, small, a small child who's not smoking very much yet. Um, and a little tweeter next to it as well. And individual reading lights, so you can do your important paperwork when you're sitting here in the back. There is a big comfy uh, armrest which pulls out. Well, I'm not sure why the bothers to pull out and stow away because there's not really a middle seat. It's, although there is a seat belt in the center, it's not actually a seat at all. Let me just sit in here. This is ridiculously uncomfortable. I'm sitting on the hump and not only that, I'm sitting on the upper edges of the two outer bucket seats. This is a very strange seating position. This is very alpha. Now because executive, there is a little cubby hole in the back, probably for a first aid kit or, I don't know, whatever else you want to put in there. But there's also a screen, which is really useful in the summertime because that's uh, quite a big expanse of glass in the back and this does keep the car a lot cooler. Now, if this was a Mercedes or a Audi or a BMW or a Skoda, this would be electrified. But no, this is Alfa Romeo, so your company executive, your managing director, has to reach down there into the pits of the parcel shelf and awkwardly fiddle this up into the roof hooks whilst sweating into the beautiful Armani suit. So we're about to go off again in another Alfa Romeo V6. Oh, nothing nicer.
an Alpha V6. Oh, listen to that thing purr. Hang on. That does sound nice. Automatic. Interestingly, when you go to reverse, this is normal. The terrifying beeps of reversing this. And off we go. That's smooth. Check out the overlap of this wiper. The passenger wiper ends in front of my face. I've never seen such an insane overlap. Sort of triangle of doom, it's an intersection of interference? No, I don't know. It's an invasion. It's an insurrection wiper. Now this car is a little bit firmer than usual because it has got uh, Bilstein dampers, uh, different springs, it's poly bushed all around and it's lowered 40 millimeters. So uh, the car is a little stiffer than standard. It's even more sports car-y than we might otherwise expect. Now when they developed this car, they actually put more time into the test driving and developing the ride and the road holding than any Alpha previously apparently. It spent hundreds of hours going around the Beloco um, test track, or Beloco, I don't even pronounce it, test track, which mimics a lot of the, the terms of uh, famous racetracks around the world, which is exactly what you want in a uh, comfortable executive car. But it was noted at the time that the car did actually handle far more like a GT car than a luxury car, certainly more so than, say, 5 Series, which I've mentioned a couple of times already. Now that V6 does have an amazing rumble to it. I think the word sonorous is probably quite appropriate to this car. And it's always there, ready to give you a bit of a blip. Quick downshift and hear the noise. Even if you don't go any faster, it's an automatic after all. Lovely. Doing the MPG no favours. It is noticeably quite firm, more than you would expect in a 166, but the payoff from that is the car does look absolutely fantastic. Now I'm told the reason this was done actually by the previous owner is because parts for the 166 are really hard to come by. There are lots of things which are unobtainable and failure can mean the car is off the road virtually indefinitely while you try and find replacements. One of those things can be um, the, the shock absorbers, the suspension components. So uh, instead of having the car not on the road, this car's got Bilsteins instead. Now being a, um, a luxury car, the steering is quite light. Now the driving position is perfect. People used to criticize things like the Sud for having bizarre legs over to one side kind of driving position, but there's nothing like that going on here. It's actually a really nicely laid out uh, driving position. So I'm sitting with my legs directly straight in front of me. Uh, my back and everything is all at a nice angle, a nice distance from the steering wheel. It's all adjustable, of course, but it just it feels so good. This is really a stunning car to look at. This is um, an era when Alfa Romeo were being very bold and producing some beautiful swoopy designs. This car, the Type 936, is the work of Walter de Silva, who also did the 156 as well. Now underneath, it's not a new platform. It's based on the Lancia Kappa, which came out in 1994. And that was Lancia's flagship for a while. But this had very heavily revised suspension, so it handles completely differently. This has got multi-link suspension all around. Obviously, disc brakes all around, it goes without saying. And this thing really does just cruise beautifully. The steering is very, very light, considering it's such a large car with such big wheels. Being front-wheel drive, it's very sure-footed, very stable, very easy. Quite communicative as well. Only a two-pedal car, of course. The whole thing is geared very much for driving ease, making it comfortable and refined, but at the same time, Alpha just couldn't resist making it fun, which they have done a great job at. I can imagine you could drive a very long way in this car and feel completely refreshed and then get out and want to drive a bit further because it's still an Alfa Romeo. Now, performance-wise, <laughs> good to talk about performance when we're in the 30 mile an hour zone. Uh, it's a rapid car. Uh, this early pre 4 cat version is 0 to 60 in 7.8 seconds for the uh, manual and 8.1 for the auto. For a big car, that's pretty impressive. Now, ownership is not without 
issues, let's say. Uh, we already mentioned the fact that some parts are hard to find. Some parts are awkward to change as well. There's a side light bulb warning out on this car at the moment because uh, it's lost a side light bulb. And that is a 56 pound part and a seven hour job to change, which is why it's currently in the glove box. Now these today are rare cars. They were not common cars even when they were new. In the UK they sold maybe 3,000 of them. Uh, currently, according to the, uh, there's a specialist supplier of parts for these cars who do their very best to actually save and maintain rather than purely break the 166s. They think there's maybe 120 of them left on the road now, which is not big numbers by any means. Part of that problem was that the 2.4 litre five cylinder diesel, a great engine, Although it was put into this chassis, it went out of production in I think 2004 or 5, before the overall end of production, but it never came to the UK. So company car drivers who, in the, uh, that's interesting, in the late noughties were crying out for diesels for benefiting kind company car tax, they never got access to it. They really missed a trick by uh, not selling that particular engine. Now, I joked earlier about this car being a Mafia car. The colour of the paint, this actual dark metallic black, is actually called Mafioso Black, believe it or not. It's a special order metallic, a bit like Panther Black on the Fords. Uh, and the quality of the finish, according to the owner, is crap. It's actually dulled and faded in a few places. So, uh, perhaps they could have tried a bit harder with that one. There's a lot you can love about this car. The way it handles, the way it feels, the, the way the cockpit wraps itself around you and encloses you. It's absolutely fabulous. I realise that there are issues with the car, with maintaining it, with running it, but having a car that looks like this, handles like this and drives like this, it's worth the uh, sacrifices, honestly. And I say that from a point of view of being, I died in the wall Alfesti, or Alfisti. This really is the last of the mad alphas. After this, they got sensible. Now, I said previously, if I was going to be spending 50 to 100,000 pounds on a super saloon, the only option for me really would be the Giulio Quadrifoglio. But if I was going to be spending a bit less money than that, I think I might have to go for one of these. In fact, toss up between one of these and a 156. Good, I don't know, maybe I'll go for the 156. I do love a 156. Now, these are rare through various faults, lack of, lack of support, lack of parts. Interestingly, it tends not to be rust that kills them. They were galvanized. Um, in fact, galvanized better at the beginning than later on. You tend to find the bodies don't rot, but the flaws do. Alphas hate speed humps. God, even trundling around at 30 miles an hour, that engine sounds glorious. You're going, are you? So the takeaway I would get from driving one of these is, although it's a big car, it feels nimble and small and light. And although there is the option of a two litre twin spark, that's a great engine, but really you want the V6 in this car. Its character suits the V6 and perhaps you can get away with the auto. I think I would prefer the manual in it if I was given the option, but very few of them are built. It's a real small number of them that actually uh, came with a manual box. There was a 3.2 as well I mentioned, but uh, that was considered to be less reliable than the uh, 3 litre. By that point, GM parts was showing their faces in the build and uh, wasn't quite as, uh, as good. This car does that trick that only the very best cars have the knack of doing. It's a great big car, it's a huge car by European standards but it absolutely wraps itself around you so you don't feel you're in a big car. I've only been driving this car for a short time, but already it feels so small and natural. It doesn't feel bigger than an Ego as I'm threading my way through traffic. It's incredible. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this beautiful piece of luxury Italian sculpture. It's a shame more people didn't take advantage of these things and buy them when they were new. They are beautiful machines deserve to be driven and seen. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe as always and join me again next time when I'm driving something completely different.